Today, I want to talk to all of us about a door, a door that divides people. And the word of the Lord to all of us is just open that door. Can you say it? Just open that door. That door locks people on one side from people on the other side. Uh, on one side is a person of one culture. On the other side is a person of another culture. On one side is a person of one skin color. On the other side is a person of another skin color. On one side is a person of one language. On the other side is a person of another language. On one side is a person of one zip code, and the other side is a person of another zip code. There are all kinds of things that divide our world. And there's a locked door that is between us. And the word that God has for all of us today is just open that door. Because when you open that door, things change. Today, we're going to meet two men that I think were voted the two men most unlikely to meet each other in the world. One man's name is Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion. The other guy, his name is Peter. He's a Jew who leads the church. And these guys are just unfamiliar with each other. They don't know about each other. And this sometimes is what divides us. We simply just don't know about each other, come from different families, different neighborhoods, different experiences. And so we're just strangers. Every single friend you have was at one time a stranger. And you met them. You came to know them. And then that person became indispensable in your life. You couldn't imagine living without them. But at some point, you had to meet a stranger to make a friend. And something happens when you open the door. God opens up new opportunities. But these men are what I would call prisoners of prejudice. It starts like this. You lock the door to keep yourself safe. And you think, whew, I'm safe. What you don't realize is you just became a prisoner inside your own house, your own life, your own fear. You see, you can lock a door not only on culture. You could actually lock a door on a spouse, your husband, your wife. You could lock it on your children. And before long, you lock one door. What happens next? You've got to lock another door and another door. And suddenly, you've backed away from the front door into your bedroom door, and then you're locked in the closet or the bathroom. And we just have all these layers of locked doors. Prejudice is a terrible way to live because you become a prisoner of your own fear. Prejudice is literally prejudging people. It's assuming how people will react. And basically, you know, we have some people we're afraid of, we're a little apprehensive of, or maybe close to, and so we associate with people who think like us, look like us, talk like us. And this comes from all kinds of angles. Obviously, I'm a white guy speaking, and I could communicate my point of view. I actually grew up in a multicultural neighborhood. Uh, I grew up in an inner city neighborhood in New York during the race riots of the late 70s. I'm oh, sorry, late 80s. Sorry again. Whew the late 60s, <laughs> and I saw firsthand what racial division did in our neighborhood and our schools, and that created a point of reference. But you could be coming here from another country, and it's just easier to talk to people who eat the foods you eat and speak the language you speak. And I lived in many different places in the world. I lived a good chunk of my life in Australia, a great chunk of my life in Hawaii, and two incredibly multicultural places. When I lived in Australia, there was this thing with Americans who lived there, and Americans would hang out with other Americans, and they would complain about life in Australia. And I thought, I didn't come 10,000 miles just to complain about where I live. So I would actually intentionally avoid communicating and relating to any Americans who lived in Australia. I spent all of my life with Australians. Why? Because I wanted to think Australian, talk Australian. I wanted to live an Australian life. And as a result, I identified with where I was. And then I lived in Hawaii, had the same experience. In Hawaii, white people like me are called haole. Do you know what it literally means? So there's the word aloha, which means to embrace, to share the breath. Haole literally means no aloha in Hawaiian. Uh, because white people came and shook hands. They said, we don't hug, we shake hands. And so the Hawaiians said, you're the no aloha people. And so us white people are the no aloha people. Leslie and I lived in a community. If you're from Hawaii, you're going to react. We live in Kalihi. Uh, whenever I meet people from Oahu and I say, I live in Kalihi, they're like, whoa, bro. Uh, because it, we were the only Caucasians for a couple of miles. And I loved living there because I wanted to identify with where I am. 
You see, prejudice is prejudging people, and it creates all this apprehension. But when you step beyond that, you discover what God has in store in strangers you've never met before. There is a powerful verse out of Acts chapter 10. If you get anything out of today's message, get this. Peter, who's a leader in the church, he should know everything. As he walks into Cornelius' house in that pizza party in the Italian home, he says, now I realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism. Have you had that realization that God doesn't show favoritism? He doesn't live, love one skin color over another, one language over another, one culture over another. He loves all of us. He's the father of all nations. Evergreen Church and no church has a host culture. I'm not a white guy here inviting the world into Evergreen Church. Rather, you see, Christ is the host, okay? And you and I are new creatures, new creations in Christ. All of us are new at what it means to be made in the image of Christ. And as a result, what unifies us together is this shared experience we all have of being new. Every single one of us, whether you come from India or Asia or South America, uh, whether you come from Europe or Australia, did I leave any country out? Please don't be offended if I did. All of us come here with a different perspective. There's no host culture here in welcoming everybody else. We're all new at being a Christian. And as a result, we are discovering the new creation together in the community of believers. Does anyone want to clap over that one? So every single revival in the book of Acts blew open the doors between cultures. Look at Acts chapter 2. Jews come from around the world, and they all hear the wonders of God in their own language, okay? The Holy Spirit comes blows up culture. Next time the Holy Spirit comes is in Samaria. The Holy Spirit will not fall upon the Samaritans until their arch enemies, the Jews, come and lay hands on them and pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit comes. See, the cross-cultural connection is essential to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, then take Saul, who becomes Paul. He is prayed for by Ananias. He doesn't receive the Holy Spirit. He has to wait three days until the man he was trying to kill comes to bless him, and then he receives a commission to reach across all cultures. Do you begin to see the theme here of the work of the Holy Spirit? Then Cornelius' house changes world history. Because of Cornelius' house and Peter and Cornelius eating spaghetti together in that home, followed with, I don't know, what would be a good Jewish dish for them to have together? My mind is not working quickly. What's that? Falafel. Falafel. There we go. We have the New Testament. You and I can freely enter into grace from all national perspectives because of these two men. The Holy Spirit fell in power. Holy Spirit falls in power in the city of Ephesus, one of the most diverse cities in the world. And there the Holy Spirit shows up in power. In Acts chapter 19, we see that a whole group of disciples are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Revival breaks open the door between cultures. God wants a multicultural church more than we do. Now, this is something that's deep within Evergreen Church. And if you're newer here, let me explain how this happened. Back in the mid-90s, I was pastoring a church in Australia. And I began crying out to God. I started having some prayer meetings. And he showed me my life plan. And in that period of time, he told me that I would one day go far away to the other side of the Pacific. He told me that I would lead a church that would be like an evergreen tree. He showed me from Ezekiel 17 that this would be a tree where many birds of many kind would take refuge in the shelter of his branches. He told me I'd have to go through 14 years of preparation and I would serve behind the scenes. So I didn't preach for 14 years, basically. Instead, I worked behind the scenes and I learned how churches work behind the scenes. He told me I would go through five ministries and learn in five different places and it would be really hard. And I said, yes, I would. And that next 14 years unfolded. And almost to the day and the week, I finished my 14-year experience, and then I made contact with Evergreen Church. I came here and found it was a church named after the Evergreens of the Northwest, but out here on the corner, we have this big, beautiful cedar tree, and I knew that I had found home, 
And this was the work that I had to do. When I first arrived here, the church was all white. And I said, Lord, I've never been in an all white church in my entire life. What do I do with this? And he said, just be patient. And about three years later, I noticed our community started to become more diverse. So in 2013, I began to teach into this. And I asked people a simple question. When you go to Starbucks across from Home Depot here, and you look at the line, what types of people do you see standing in the line? And when you come to your church, does our church demographic match our neighborhood? And of course, the answer was no. And then I said, how do you feel about that? And we started exploring that question more and more. And then I began to see that Evergreen opened up to the whole community. Why does that matter? Well, 90 languages are spoken in this neighborhood. Take that in. 48% of our population in this immediate area here is non-Caucasian. My particular community, where I live just north of here, 87% uh, of my neighbors were born somewhere else other than the United States. So for us just to do church for white people isn't a reflection of what's taking place here in our community because we serve a God of love who loves everyone. He wants a multicultural church more than we do. Listen to one of the core verses that describes the nature and character of God from Deuteronomy 6.4. Every Jew would say this as a morning prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Of course, it's not in English. They're going to say it in Hebrew. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ahad. Ahad means one. The nature and the core of God is he is one. There are not three gods who make one God. There are three persons who are so unified in love for one another. They are one. So the Trinity is this inferno of love, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in total surrender to one another in love. And then what does God do with this gift of oneness? He shares it with us. God loves diversity because this shows the power of his unity. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. He loves bringing us together because there he commands the blessing. And the blessing is his blessing of achad. He brings his oneness to us. God is love. This isn't a political statement because I know some of you are going there in your head. You think, oh, this is, no, this is not political. This is deeply biblical. It's deeply evangelical. It's deep within the very core DNA of what it means to be the church. The church should be the first in the world to show everybody else how to get along. Sometimes you're going to be in the community and sometimes feel this impression that the government or different you know, social organizations are kind of leading the forefront of you know, cultural diversity. Can I just tell you that our, our family story, I mean, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, in world history, there is no example of diversification in society anywhere in all world history until Acts chapter 2. This is the first time it ever exists. Never in world history had people of different cultures worshiped together ever in any place anywhere in world history until the church. The church is the place where the world comes together. Now, of course, we can tell lots of stories of how we get it wrong, but I can tell you more stories of how we get it right. This is our core DNA. It's not a side issue. I know right now we, we, we sometimes feel uncomfortable with these conversations about race, and we just want to set it aside. No, this is a core issue to God. This is central to God. Because the more we enter into this, the more we experience his oneness, the more we experience the power of the Holy Spirit, and then the world will learn from us how to get along. What I noticed at Evergreen, the more we taught into this, the more I noticed the city of Bothell came and talked to us. The, the universities talked to us. We were invited to some of the early roundtables here in our city about racial connection between different ethnic groups. I remember getting contacted by Bothell City departments, and they, two different times, they said, could you please instruct us in how to hire more people of different ethnic backgrounds? I remember one time there were some break-ins taking place in Indian homes, and Bothell PD contacted us because they said, you have the largest uh, database of Indian families so that we can just reach out to them and get the news out. And I felt incredibly honored to receive that. Even at our food truck night, 
And if you haven't come to food trucks, please come on August the 9th. That's our next one. At this food truck event, we're obviously Evergreen Church people. But when I looked around the, the crowd, I saw people walking in off the street. There were Hindu families. There was a Sikh family. There was uh, some Hindu and, I'm sorry, Buddhist families. I saw people from many different perspectives, and they were just there enjoying the music, enjoying the food. And that's also a reflection of the depth of love. Even the guy who drove the shawarma truck, he, was, uh, he introduced himself. He said, I'm a Palestinian. And I'm not, I said, I'm not sure. I thought to myself, I'm not sure how this thing's going to go. But by the end of it, his name was Muhammad. He said to me, I really like you Christians. He said, you're so talkative. You're easy to talk to. And he wants to come back and bring his truck on the third night. That's, yeah. The church should be showing the world how to get along. So how do we do that? Well, number one, just open that door with prayer. It's pretty simple, but prayer. You know, basically, in this story, you've got an Italian praying and a Jew praying. They're both praying to the same God, but they're caught up in their individual worlds. But prayer is what brings them together. And I think if we prayed more into this, the Holy Spirit would open up more doors. It's pretty simple. It's pretty basic. But the God of love wants to pull us together. But we just have to pray our way into these opportunities. Um, I, I want you to meet these characters. First is this man named Cornelius. And Cornelius comes from a place called Caesarea. Uh, I've been there multiple times. It's one of my favorite archaeological ruins in Israel because you can walk through the city. You can see the ruins of the palace of Herod, the huge amphitheater. You can see the Hippodrome and, of course, the beautiful beaches. It's all there. Cornelius is a Roman. He lives in a separate, isolated world. And he's a busy guy. But he's so busy, he must pray. There's a sermon in itself for all of us who think we're so busy, too busy to pray. He's so busy, he must pray. And the scripture says that in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. That means he has 100 men who he leads in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man who's named Simon, who is called Peter. That journey from Cornelius to Peter is just 40 miles. It would take about 14 hours of walking to get from one place to the other. Not very far, just 40 miles. Yet those people could have been separated by 40 light years. They were just so far apart from each other. There's no reason humanly why, why their lives should collide. That's why God had to send an angel. Whenever you see angels appearing in the New Testament, it's always an indication that God has to make such a change in human relationships. It takes outside intervention. It's like taking a train locomotive from one set of tracks and just lifting it up and putting it on another set of tracks. And so God's going to intersect these two lives. This is how much it matters to God. And then we got to meet Simon Peter. He's a Jew. And as a Jew, he's been raised by his mom and his dad. You don't eat pork. You don't eat bacon. Uh, you don't eat rabbit. You can't have lobster. Those are a few things you can't eat. Uh, and you definitely never, ever go to an Italian's home for pizza because that's just not what Jews do. In his entire life, Peter had never walked inside of a home of anybody who was not a Jew. It had just never, ever been done. Uh, but about noon the following day, as these men were coming from Cornelius' house to walk the 14-hour trip down to Peter's house, they approached the city. Peter went up on the roof to pray because he's thinking about lunch. He became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. He was used to that picture. It was common to him because as a fisherman, he would have pulled down the sail, put the fish in, and dragged them to market and put them out on the street to sell. This was a common picture in his mind. 
And of course, inside of that thing are all things that he can't eat. There's not just pigs, but there's other things in there he definitely can't eat. And it's not just simply eat it. It's like, Peter, kill it and eat it, like be fully committed to the meal. <laughs> I wish we could fully grasp just how disturbing this message is to Peter. This message makes it possible for all of us to be here. Uh, this message makes it possible for the New Testament to be written. Uh, this message created a faith that didn't just simply become a sect of Judaism. It became the most prevalent religion around the world. It was this moment where Peter had his prejudice challenged. He had to stop prejudging people. You see, the problem with prejudice is that prejudice slows us down. Because prejudice makes me apprehensive. You know, the door's locked. Maybe I open it, but I got the chain on the door so that it's still going to look through. I'm not really sure if I'm going to go check. And we're really slow. Prejudice slows us down because we tend to avoid people who have a different language base than we do and talk to people who you know, talk our language or we're apprehensive to talk to somebody of a different skin color or ethnic background because it's more comfortable talking to our own ethnic background. And we all fall into these categories. It doesn't matter where you're from. But prejudice slows down the love of God because he's wanting to work across all these boundaries. He's a God of all nations. But he can't do his work because of our fears, apprehension, our place of origin. Our only hope is prayer because prayer speeds things up. Prayer gets you onto God's agenda. Watch what happened to Peter. Well, Peter is still thinking about the vision. The Spirit said to him, now this is the problem. When you and I can receive a revelation from God, walk across the room, talk to that person, love somebody next door, visit your neighbor at Diwali and take them some candy or whatever the connection may be, we're apprehensive. We say, I'm going to think about it. You know, we keep that bag of candy by the door all Diwali week and our neighbors are shooting off fireworks and we're well, not really, really sure if I'm going to do that. I'm not sure. Did I, did I hear God? Can I give you a word from the Lord? Just take the candy to your neighbors. <laughs> we think too much. Just love. Think about it later. The Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs and do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. Why would he hesitate? Because prejudice slows us down, but prayer speeds us up. Here's something really basic when you read the Bible. Heaven is fast and earth is slow. Heaven is fast in obedience. Angels are swift in flight. Uh, messengers are being dispatched from the throne to do instant work. Everything in heaven is fast, but on earth is incredibly slow. It can take weeks, months, years, decades, even, you know, millennia for God to be able to do his work because we human beings are so slow to obey. And that's why we have to pray more so we can obey more. Obedience really matters to God. Obedience matters so much to God, he doesn't want you to think about love. He just wants you to love and then think about later on what you just did. That's worth a clap as well. So to learn about overcoming prejudice, you have to learn from the world's biggest ethnic divide. Now, there are many, many, many ethnic divides in our country. And I, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but none of the ethnic divides in our country are as big as the one I'm going to tell you about. Uh, some of you come from India. We have a lot in our community from India. Uh, India has the caste system, and I think there's probably more ethnic divides in India than any place I've ever seen, 6,000 different levels of division in society. Uh, but none of those are as deep as what I'm going to talk to you about. The core human division. You ready? It's between Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised. It's the core human division. And if you don't believe me, here's the evidence. Uh, news in the Middle East. As soon as I say that, you assume what would come next would be bad news because the world is fixated on what's happening in Jerusalem, what's happening around Jerusalem, what about the nations around Jerusalem. Everybody's in consternation, as the Scripture says, that Jerusalem causes the nations to stagger, okay? This is the core 
issue. And it should be because of the people of God and it's literally the center of the world. Africa, Asia, Europe all intersect in the country that God chose to work in and the city he has for himself. So that would also suggest that the medicine that comes to heal that racial wound will apply to all racial wounds. So a few years ago, I, I've done a lot of trips to Israel, but I'm having this growing love for what God is doing with the believers in Israel. God began to speak to me, and he said, they have the secret that then can be shared with the nations that is going to bring healing to the world. And so I spent a lot of time with believers there, and I hope, by the grace of God, to do even more, because there is a revival taking place right now in the nation of Israel. Uh, the church there has grown from about 10,000 believers is now about 50,000. So Israel's an incredibly young country. These are largely young believers. Uh, they're very passionate about their faith. And of course, Jews come from all around the world. Uh, they come from many, many different nations. And so these are people who have different skin colors and languages and backgrounds all living together in the land of Israel. And they are what we would call messianic believers. They are Jews who've been completed in Yeshua, Jesus as Messiah, and they form their life together as a messianic community. They're not called churches, they're called congregations, and this helps them to connect more with the neighbors that they live with, and particularly we have a relationship with a church in the main port city of Israel, beautiful, beautiful beach community called Ashdod, lovely high rises looking over, beautiful waterfront. And it's filled with largely Jews from North Africa and other Arab nations and a lot of uh, Russian and Ukrainian Jews. And God's just birthed a beautiful church there, about 300 Messianic believers. And they love Jesus. The senior pastor is Israel Pakhtar and then his son, Sasson. His name means joy in Hebrew, Sasson. He is the youth pastor. And their church is leading the way in evangelism and racial reconciliation. So while you're seeing all the bad news, let me tell you some of the good news. In Israel, for the last 20 years, there's been a community that meets secretly together of Arab Israeli pastors and their families and the Messianic Jewish pastors and their families. And they go to beautiful waterfront resorts once a year and they just have relaxed time together as families together, praying for one another, encouraging each other. And today in Israel, uh, there's great collaboration between Jews and Arabs taking place in the land. You don't see that stuff in the news, but it's happening, and you and I as a church are directly connected with it. And then beyond that, you've got all the Arab nations around there, some of which are committed to the destruction of Israel and of Jewish people, extreme anti-Semitism. There's this conference that takes place every year in Istanbul because it's the only country where Arabs can come and Christians can come and Jews can come. And they have this conference of young people who are coming to faith in all these different nations. So you've got people there from Iran, Iraq, Sudan, uh, Saudi, from Syria, from Lebanon, as well as Israel. And they have this conference. So youth pastor Sasson is speaking in Istanbul just a few months ago in March at this conference. And when he got done, this big burly, strong, tall guy, I'm going to call him Mohammed uh, from Hezbollah, uh, came up to see him. Obviously, there's a little bit of height, height differential between the two guys. And uh, Mohammed said to Sasson, I want to talk to you. Now, Sasson is no wimp. He is a soldier and officer in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. He can kill people with his bare hands. That's what they're trained to do. And so as they started talking, Muhammad said, uh, I was on the border of Lebanon pointing guns at you. And Sasson said, well, I was on the border of Lebanon and, and Israel, and we were pointing guns at you. And then Muhammad starts you know, talking about his military background. He was a member of what's called Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization recognized most countries in the world as a terrorist organization committed to the destruction of Israel and the murder of Jewish people. He said, well, I was probably hiding in a bush next to you trying to kidnap you. And then Sasson said, well, I think I could take you down. Don't you love that David and Goliath spirit inside of him? 
And then Muhammad started telling about meeting Jesus, about the persecution that he's under. Every day there are reprisals against him because of his faith in Jesus. But at the change that Jesus has made in his life to be able to love a Jew as a brother. And there in that hotel in Istanbul, these two men hugged and wept because of the love of Jesus. Prejudice is a terrible thing. But when the door is open, it's a beautiful thing. And that's where we learn the lesson of how to heal the wounds of the world and the wounds of our own nation, the wounds of our own city. If you and I can approach things more with prayer, we'd see more open. The other is we've got to approach things with more curiosity. Curiosity is a permission to ask questions. What's your favorite food? Uh, well, how do you see that from your point of view? Uh, asking people about customs. Have you ever asked your Indian neighbors why do they hang flowers over their door? Have you been curious about somebody's point of view and their background, just approaching life with curiosity? This is exactly what happens in the life of Peter and Cornelius. Neither one of them have ever walked inside of the home of another culture before. They're only 40 miles apart, but they are so far apart from one another. And everything inside of Cornelius is saying to him, don't open that door to a Jew. Here's some things about Cornelius. First is his name, Cornelius. This is a clue that he's probably from a Roman leading family called the Cornelii. That doesn't mean anything to you. But in our society, I would say the Kennedys or the Bushes. These were, was a Roman family that created political leaders. Most of the proconsuls in the Roman world, those would be like governors of different territories, came from the Cornelii family. This is an incredibly famous family. And he's a member of what's called the Italian Regiment. These are strapping Italian men brought from the precincts of the city of Rome. And they are in the land of what they call Palestine to protect the Roman governor. Previous to this, it was Pontius Pilate. It's another guy now. So these are, he's a crack troop. We could safely say that Cornelius is an Italian stallion, and he has never had a Jew inside of his house before. And everything's saying to him, keep that door locked. And if you have somebody come to the door you don't trust, send somebody else or look through the peephole or just look through the door chain. But the Holy Spirit says, open the door. And so when Peter comes to the door, Cornelius says to him, we are all now here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. He throws a pizza party to welcome the Jew. He's got all his friends and neighbors there. You can just see this warm, gregarious personality. It's kind of like a Dean Valento. That's what I think of Dean when I see you as Cornelius. Just welcoming everybody in because he's no longer a prisoner of his own prejudice. Everything inside of Peter is saying, don't walk through that door. Now, I'm going to tell you something about Peter that you probably didn't know before, but there are clues of it in the New Testament. And you know that story when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Peter pulls out a sword, and he's, of course, just before that told Jesus he has two swords. Uh, what he's describing is actually a, a political agenda. Uh, there was a group called the Zealots. They were committed to getting the Romans out of the land. And so they, these Zealots, there were a certain group of Zealots, they were called the Dagger Men, and they kept little swords. So this means that there were two swords, there were at least two Dagger Men in the disciples. It would be like a concealed weapon. One of them, I'm certain, was Simon the Zealot, and the other one probably was Peter himself. The fact that Peter goes and he tries to slash off the, high priest's ear, uh, the ear of the high priest's servant is an indication that he was probably a dagger man, but he also was poorly trained and doesn't very good in the dark trying to kill somebody. Um, so here's a guy who is committed to killing Romans with random acts of violence, who's now walking inside of the home of a Roman. The guy who had never eaten pork or bacon or lobster in his life is going to walk through the door. And when he gets inside the house, he says, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. Try that on an Orthodox Jew. He says, no objection. May I ask, why have you sent for me? Have you dropped your objections? 
Have you unlocked the door? You know, we need to walk through it toward people with a new sense of curiosity, not just about the culture, but here's the bigger curiosity is, how does this person matter to God? Because everybody matters to God. Every culture is put onto this planet because everybody matters to God. And this is what Peter said. He says, now I get it. I realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Peter just rocked every sermon you've ever, ever heard, every Sunday school you know, wives' tale that you have ever believed. It messes with my theology. He says that God accepts people who fear him and does what is right. He has not mentioned sinner's prayer. He hasn't mentioned baptism. He hasn't mentioned any of the steps. This suggests to us that in places where you don't think God's working, he's working. He's working in the Hindu temple. He's working in the mosque across the street. I have a friend in Australia, Steve Shakalati. What a beautiful name. He runs a TV program in Thailand where he specializes in reaching Buddhists because he's found the gateways and pathways within Buddhism where Christ is reaching for people within Buddhism. And I know immediately you're going to react and think, are you saying, Phil, that all religions lead to God? No, they don't. But it is saying that God is making pathways into every religion to bring people to himself. God values the search of searching people. I had a pastor come and see me a couple of weeks ago, and he was trying to get his head around Evergreen. And I was trying to explain to him Alpha in the spirit of hospitality, how we welcome people, and what's behind Culture's Coffee House. And I kind of felt like it was going right over his head. And then I looked over his shoulder, and I wanted to start laughing because I saw what I've been watching unfold for the last few weeks. It started with two and eventually became five Hindu grandpas. Uh, making the way into our building. They're always careful to come through the front door and to get coffee from Culture's Coffee House. It started when they first came into our building. They wanted to see the place of prayer. This is a very common thing when Hindus come into our building. And so we took them to our prayer room. We showed them our place of prayer. And then they want to receive prayer. Uh, and then they started buying coffee. And as this has unfolded, of course, the group grew from two to five. They came into the coffee shop and they met Cameron. Now, you would think because Cameron's from Mumbai and he speaks Hindi that they would be able to, you know, get on a great conversation. But this is another thing you don't realize if you're, you don't ask enough questions. India is as complicated as Europe, many, many different languages. And so they actually didn't all speak the same language. So with a little bit of Hindi and a little bit of English, they tried to communicate. They looked up at a sign that we had in our coffee shop. It says, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And I've often wondered, how do non-believers receive this? I discovered how they receive it. Because they said to Cameron, do you sell alcohol here at Culture's Coffee House? Because they thought it meant spirits. <laughs> Cameron said, once he finished laughing hysterically for some considerable point of time, by the way, we don't sell alcohol at Culture's. There is a really good cold brew, but it's not that kind of brew. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he said, no. And then they politely asked for prayer. Probably didn't know what to say next. <laughs> and so Cameron started asking him some more questions. And he said, what do you miss about India? Now, another fact of what's taking place in our neighborhood, when you see these older Indian couples walking up down the street, they're the parents of Indian families who've come over to spend six months, usually for the visa, with their family members here. And they're incredibly proud of their son or daughter who have made it in America. It's a big deal. They've poured their lifeblood to get them to this point. And so these men said, in India, we worked hard all of our lives to help our kids get here. And then when we come here, we have no money. We can't drive because the exchange rate, the money isn't worth as much. And they can't drive anywhere. So the only place where they have to go every day is to walk to Evergreen Church because there's no other business around here that they can walk to. And they said, we feel so much shame because we're dependent on our children. And they're so busy, and they don't have time for us. And we're wondering, and, and then Cameron stopped, and he said, I want to tell you on behalf of all the young people of India, 
how thankful we are for investing into us as our parents. And as a result, we are able to be here. That com opened up the conversation further. And Cameron was able to pray for them and bless them in Jesus' name. And he added this. He said, Christianity in the church isn't a religion, but this is a place of love. <laughs> you see, religion is people searching for God. But our faith is Jesus is God searching for us. <laughs> and he's looking inside of each religion to create pathways of people to be able to find him. And this is what Peter does as he presents Jesus. He does one thing in this sermon different than all the other Acts sermons, evangelistic sermons. He says this, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him him. He presents a picture of Jesus searching for us, of God searching for us, not of a God that's up there who's, who's capricious and perhaps going to punish me for any misdeed I do, but a God of love and compassion who comes to us and dies on the cross for us and makes the way for us to find him. And that is the message of good news. It reaches across every culture. So we just walk through the door by prayer. We just walk through the door by curiosity. We just walk through the door with expectation. What, what's God going to do with this overture of love? What's God going to do with this conversation? What's God going to do with this relationship? This is what Peter does. He walks inside of the house, and he preaches a stock standard evangelical message that's found all throughout the book of Acts. It's like they all had the same formula they're working from. And while Peter was still speaking these words, something happened that hadn't happened before. Without an altar call, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, these are the straight-laced Jews, who came with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Before they had been baptized, before they had prayed a sinner's prayer, before any hands had been laid upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them power, and they were already praying in tongues. Because God said, I'm going to overcome your theology, and I'm going to reach the whole world. And so many of us have this closeness of prejudice that we have to overcome, and God just wants to blow it up. And it doesn't matter if he works over the top of you and me to be able to reach people beyond us, but he works far more powerfully when you and I step between that gap that separates us and other people who aren't like us. Here's something I learned. Lean into what is uncomfortable and see what God does next. L let me explain. My niece married a Hindu Gujarati man. And our family have been believers in the U.S. for over 400 years. First time in 400 years of our family history anybody married a non-Christian. And it kind of rocked our world, and then it made it more complicated. He was Indian and Hindu, and we're like, whoa, what do we do with this? And so I was on the phone all the time to Jedediah. I said, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And he was so good, so calming. He just coached me through the whole entire experience. Went to Chicago for a three-day Indian wedding. Because Indian weddings aren't about just marrying people. It's about actually entire family groups and cities marrying each other. So they said, they kept apologizing. It's a short wedding. It's a small wedding. I mean, they had tour buses taking people around everywhere. <laughs> and after three days of dancing with our new extended Indian family, it came the time for the ceremony. We're at this beautiful golf club in Chicago. And the groom's, fam the groom's family arrive. And of course, normally have an elephant, but the groom didn't want to do the elephant. He felt he could be a bit seasick there. So they had this beautiful sports car, and they had this incredible sound system, and they were all dancing. And I got dragged into their party, which was a lot more fun than my family, because they were up at the sports club looking incredibly white, all right? And all of my family are pastors, and they're looking just, that was basically the look, just dumbfounded. And I thought, well, I'm going to dance with the Hindus. So I'm dancing. But here's the secret of Indian dancing. Just pretend you're changing light bulbs. That's how it works. <laughs> so you're just changing light bulbs up the driveway. And you're doing this. And, and you kind of fit in. And then we got up to the door. And by this point, it's loud. It's a total dance party. Everybody's in this thing. And they're pulling people from my straight-laced family into the dance party. 
but one family member was incredibly stubborn, and he was not going to give in. And he shouts at about 120 decibels in my ear. At what point in the order of service do I pray? Because he had a little form there. He's, he, and I remember I just shouted back, I don't think they care about your sor or service order. I think they want you to dance. And at that point, I was literally dragged into the circle and back to changing the light bulbs and dancing around. And then I looked out the corner of my eye, and there he is with this big fat Bible with his order of service hanging out, dancing with the Hindus out in the parking lot. They then asked me to say something at the wedding. I thought, what do I say? And I realized, you know, one of the keys of the Indian soul is romance. This is what Bollywood's built around. The whole nation of India is all about weddings. And so I told them the story of the Song of Solomon about the groom who was looking for true love and how he wanted somebody to love him as a king without any, you know, you know, selfish ulterior motive, and he finds his true love. And the whole story, it's a beautiful story, Song of Solomon. And afterwards, one of the leading diamond merchants in the U.S. came up to me and started talking for an extended period of time, spiritual questions about Jesus. And then over the next few years, all these Hindu family members came to my mom's funeral, to my dad's funeral. And my dad's funeral, I spent more time with the Hindus than I did with the Christians. And then I discovered someone watched us online. By the way, God bless you if you're there watching online. So glad you're with us. And I began to see when you lean into what's uncomfortable, God's at work. At the very end of the, the three-day wedding, we're all having breakfast together. And some ladies in saris came and sat at our table. And they said, you know, when... Your niece first, you know, started the relationship with our son or grandson. We, you know, we weren't really comfortable. We, we had all kinds of questions about you people. <laughs> but now we think this is good. And see, somebody just opened the door. God is love. <laughs> and you and I are here to express and to reveal the love of God. If you're at home watching online, he loves you. He loves our city. You know, our city has a little motto. It's called Begin in Bothell. I thought, why not? Why don't we begin a revival here in Bothell? Amen. Our church has a front door. And that front door is not a physical door. It's you. You and I are the front door of Evergreen Church. And every time you walk across the distance, you talk to somebody from a different culture, you and I are opening the door so a person can come in. The first person who ever prophesied over my life I'd ever be a pastor I wasn't even following Jesus, was a pastor from Zambia. And after the first service, was a lady at the door said, hey, welcome to Evergreen. So good to see you. I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from Zambia. And I said, that was the very first person who ever gave me a sense that I was going to be a pastor. And then she prayed a prayer of blessing over my life. So good when you walk across the space. You're going to receive a blessing from God. And you become an open door. Do you believe this in your heart? Let's stand up. I want to pray a blessing over your life. And so, Father, I pray right now over the church in this room, I pray over the church online, that you would fill us with a love beyond ourself and a courage to step through what's uncomfortable, to express the love of God, and that this church will become marked and sealed by you as a church of nations, and that from this place you will reach the nations. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would take over Evergreen Church and do something beautiful here, something seismic here, something world-changing here. And I pray that your kingdom would come in power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And if you believe that and receive that, can you thank the Lord right now for the word he's given to us? We believe in you, Lord. We trust in you you. We're going to give our gifts, our tithes, and offerings to God. I'm going to invite our host to come up. I want to pray over the finances in your world. Here's a promise from God. Cornelius was remembered because of his gifts. Your gifts are a memorial to God. He has not forgiven, forgotten a single dollar you've ever given. Everything is recorded and known in heaven. And what you're sowing today is going to be remembered in heaven for your future. And I pray, Father, your blessing on what is sown today and the tithes and offerings. Use this 
not only to bless this ministry, but to bless those who give it. In the power of Jesus' name, amen.